Hey guys, thanks so much for being a part of the service. We've been doing a series called Just Pray. And one of the reasons why is because we just think our nation needs prayer. Our church needs prayer. Our families need prayer. And so we've been talking about it. And today I wanted to talk about the fact that prayer isn't always easy. You know, prayer is a very powerful thing, but it's not always easy. One of the reasons it's not easy is because the Bible says we're supposed to pray without ceasing. I don't do very good with that. I don't know about you guys, but um, honestly, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I will get into my day and I'll think back and think, man, I didn't pray or I forgot to pray, let alone pray without ceasing. Um, you know, the Bible also says that we're supposed to substitute worry for prayer or rather substitute, yeah, substitute worry for prayer. And that's not easy to do either because I'm a big worrier. And, you know, when the Bible says that I'm supposed to, instead of worry, pray, and then when I pray, I pray in thanksgiving, you know, it's hard enough to let go of worry, but when I'm supposed to actually be thankful for the situations that cause the worry, that's even that much more difficult. So, but that's what prayer is all about. I mean, prayer is about, you know, turning my back on worry and turning my face towards the one who can take care of the situations that I'm in uh, because he has all power. You know, another thing uh, that makes prayer kind of tough is the fact that prayer, we're supposed to pray for our enemies. You know, that's not fun. I don't want to pray for my enemy. You know, um, that is good things for my enemy. And, you know, so uh, I'm definitely supposed to, I mean, praying for me is one thing. Um, praying that my needs be met, that's, that's one thing. Praying for others, okay, I'll do that. Uh, I'll pray for the ones I love. But when it comes to praying for others and praying for the ones that are, would be considered my enemies, you know, that's, that's just not easy. That's a, that's a pretty heavy lift. Um, but the reason Jesus says that is because he says, you don't get credit for loving the people that love you back. You get credit for loving the people that hate your guts. And, you know, Jesus wants to raise up, you know, Jesus doesn't want to raise up a bunch of people who are all the same. Jesus wants to raise up people that are going to change the world. And he wants to raise up people that are different than the world because the only way you're really going to make a difference with your life is to be different. And he teaches us to have love and not just love, but radical love. And that love is to be shown to, you know, people that at least in our opinion are, you know, uh, unlovable. So what Jesus does is he, he gives us a sermon on the Mount. You know, the sermon on the Mount is this just ridiculous paradigm shift. Jesus comes in and starts teaching things that nobody has ever heard before. And one of the things he said was this, Matthew 5, 43, he says, you've heard that the law says, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Nobody had ever heard that before. That was completely a paradigm shift from what the, from the norm of what everybody was used to. Uh, but that's what, that's what Jesus did. In verse number 45, he says, in that way you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. Why? Well, because he gives sunlight to both evil and good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. And so, you know, basically what that's saying is, is, you know, the fact that you, you've probably heard before when, when people walk up to kids and they look at a kid and they go, you look just like your daddy. You got your dad's eyes, you got your dad's smile, you got your dad's chin, you got your dad's nose, you know, or whatever. They say, I can tell he's your dad. Well, it's the same thing spiritually. People ought to look at us and say, wow, I can tell you're just like your dad. You're just like your heavenly father. You have your father's love. You have your father's patience. You have your father's joy. You know, you have all these different things that are just like your heavenly father. And, but, but the biggest thing, of course, is, is that kind of love, that radical love that, that God has for people. Verse 46 says, if you only love those who love you, what reward is there for that? He says, you know, even corrupt tax collectors do that much. So he basically says, again, you don't get credit for loving the people that love you back. Uh, just the ones that are considered your enemies or, or the ones that hate your guts. So, you know, the cool thing about Jesus is that he never asks you to do something that he's not willing to do himself. You know, um, two and a half years into the future from this point, Jesus is going to be hanging on a cross. And he's going to be staring down at the very people that put him on the cross. And he's going to say a prayer. And this is the prayer that he's going to say, say for the people that murdered him and hung him on the cross. Um, Luke 23, 34, first part of the verse says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. 
you know, that's Jesus's way of saying, I'm gonna look past what you're doing to me. And I'm gonna focus on the fact that one day soon, you're gonna die. And when you die, you're gonna stand before the Father. You're gonna stand before my Father. And if you think of it, you know, Jesus was literally dying on the cross for all the people that were putting him on the cross. He loved his murderers so much that he was willing to die for them. That's why he came up with the whole prayer of they don't know what they're doing because it was true. They had no clue what they were doing. They were sacrificing a man that loved them from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. And, and so they, didn't, they obviously didn't know what they were doing. So the question is, why would you pray for your enemies? Well, same reason, because they're gonna die too. <laughs> and they're gonna stand before God. And the temporary hurt that they've brought into your life or into my life absolutely pales in consideration to the eternal destiny that they're gonna have one day because they have an eternal soul. And one day they're gonna stand before God and give an account for their life. And, you know, they're going to have an eternal consequence, you know, one of, one of two ways. Uh, and so it's worth it to pray for them. You know, it doesn't make sense. It's a big picture thing. It's a heavy lift. You know, it's a broad perspective thing for sure. Um, but it's the perspective Jesus had. And it's the thing that he taught us to do in the Sermon on the Mount. And so we ought to obey him and do it, even when it doesn't even make any sense. Um, think of it this way. If there is a God, and there is a God, uh, the Bible says the fool says in his heart, there is no God. First verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, God. So it's not hard to find God in the Bible. He's everywhere. And if you don't believe it, you're a fool. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a sensitive subject, but that's just what the Bible says. Don't shoot the messenger, right? Um, but, you know, the, the Bible basically says, if there is a God, and of course there is a God, uh, then there's really only one of two places that you can spend eternity. You're either going to be with God or you're not going to be with God. And the Bible talks about it specifically. It talks about a heaven, talks about a hell. Uh, that's code for with or without God. Heaven and hell, with or without God. And the, the, the cool thing about God, he's so gracious and he loves us so much that he actually gives us the choice as to whether or not we experience a death with or without him. He gives us the choice. The choice is totally ours. You're 100% welcome. We started this church back in 2003 to tell people everywhere that you are welcome to be with God for the rest of eternity. You're welcome to spend the rest of eternity with God. As soon as you pass away and stand before him, you can spend forever with him. And, you know, there's a lot of things that God says about it. For example, he gave us an invitation. He literally gave us an invitation to be with him forever. It's called the Bible. And people talk about the Bible all the time. They say, it's a really thick book. I don't know where to start reading. I don't understand it. And everybody says all that kind of stuff about the Bible, but you know, it's an invitation. It's an invitation from the God of the universe who made you saying this, I want you to be with me forever. Read my invitation, take me up on my offer. He even goes even farther, like in John 14. And he says this, I made a place for you. You know, remember what it's like in high school? It can be creepy in high school. If you're in high school, I, I, it can be creepy. But you come to lunch and you're looking for that seat. And then there's that one person that kind of looks this way and looks up at you and says, hey, right here, I got a seat for you. And you're like, everything just gets better in life. Why? Because somebody prepared a place for you. I remember 10 years ago, Bob and Lois Surface celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. They invited Christine and I to go to the wedding anniversary, their celebration. And Bob told me, he goes, Barry, look, there's not a whole lot of seats, but we want you to be there. We'd like you to, for you to pray. And there were so few seats that there were some of my family I wasn't even able to invite. And I thought, whoa, he, had a he, he, he has a place for me. I'm not even really a part of his family. And that, that wasn't the part that got Christine and I the most. What got us the most is when we found out our table assignment. I thought we'll be in some back table by the kitchen or bathroom or whatever. We were in the very first front table sitting with Bob, Lois, Frank, Sandra, Kim, and David, their kids, and me and Chris. I'm thinking to myself, wow, when he said he had a place for me, did he ever have a place for me? Well, can we take that and times it by about a million? Uh, because Bob was asking us to go to Heritage Hunt. And Jesus is asking us to go to heaven. 
He's saying, I got a place for you. It's called heaven. And I've reserved it for you. And I've given you an invitation. And I've, I've made a way for you to be in this place. And, and, and that's how much I love you. But the crazy part about God's love is he's not going to force you to do it. He's not going to force you. You know, Bob could have invited us to his anniversary and I could have said, hey, Bob, thank you. But no, thank you. Uh, we're doing something else. You know, I could, have, I could have declined. God's offering you the greatest invitation of all. It's called eternal life. He's saying, choose me, pick me. <laughs> That's literally God saying, pick me. I love you that much. I want you to be with me forever. And, you know, but, but the crazy thing is, he also loves us too much to force us to do it. He's not gonna force you to do it. You know, if you think about it, a lot of times we look at it as, you know, well, God is putting people in hell or, or whatever. Pe people are apart from God because they choose to be. It's just the way it is. It's not about a denomination. You know, it's not about you coming to this church, you know, or whatever. It's about a relationship with Jesus who connects you with a holy and a righteous father called God the Father, you know, the God of the universe. And, you know, it's one thing to suffer because of something that is completely outside of your control. It's another thing to suffer forever for something that you could have decided. You could have made the choice to be with him. And that's what breaks my heart, probably more than anything. That's literally why we do this. It's literally why I do what I do every weekend. And man, I don't know why I'm getting so broken up right now, but it just doesn't make any sense to me that people would reject that invitation. I don't know if it's pride or if it's stubbornness. It's probably all of the above, sin. You know, I've had people tell me before, I'd rather sin than be with God. I mean, that's not a good choice. It's a bad trade. Sin brings death and destruction, but you know, I just think about, you know, verses like Romans 10, 13. God says, whoever calls on my name, I'll save them. You know, John 3, 16. Everyone knows it, but at the end of the verse, he said, whoever believes in Jesus won't perish, but you'll have everlasting life. That's in the invitation. You know, RSVP, please. Um, John chapter 10 and verse number nine, you know, at the beginning of the verse, he says, I am the door. You know, and by me, if any man enter in, he'll be saved. You know, I'm the door, open the door, come in the door. You know, I am, I'm the one that I want you to call on. I'm the one that, you want, that I want you to believe in. And if you'll, if you'll do these things, you'll be with me forever. And so, um, you know, some people say, well, if, you know, like in Ephesians 1, 4, where it talks about the fact that God chose us before the foundations of the earth. If, if God is the one that chooses us, then how do we have a choice in the matter? Well, because you're talking about, basically when you talk about God's choice and man's choice, you're talking about, you know, God's knowledge and omniscience versus man's limited knowledge. I mean, God can't help but already know every single person on the planet that ever has lived or ever will live that ever calls on his name and believes in him. He already knows. But you know what? We don't. I didn't know it. I didn't know that I would do it. Not until somebody told me about Jesus not until I made it up in my own mind. And I get it. I mean, every day of my life was recorded in his book before a single day passed, like it says in Psalm 139. Sure, absolutely. But God can't help to be sovereign. God can't help to be omniscient. He's God. The, the, the fact of the matter is, we don't know. I didn't know. J. Vernon McGee, one of the best Bible teachers of all, and had a church out in California, and an incredible radio ministry, and... You know, he used to tell the story about the whole, you know, predestination thing and, and the choosing thing and all that. And he said that, you know, picture a group of people that are walking down a big, huge road and everybody's on the road and everybody's going the same way, you know, and, you know, wide is the way, broad is the way that leads to destruction, the Bible says. And so everybody's on this path to destruction. All of a sudden, a man sees a small path over to the right-hand side and he says, wow, I'm going to investigate this. So he begins to investigate and he walks down the path and he comes to this door. Out of nowhere, there's this big door and it goes into the side of this hill, you know, and he's like, whoa. And he looks at the top of the door and there's a sign. And the sign says this, I am the door. 
by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. The man looks at the sign and goes, wow. So if I go through that door, I'm saved. He says, I'm in. He opens up the door. He believes with his heart. He walks through the door. The door slams behind him. He turns around and there's a sign on the other side of the, of the door. And it says this, chosen before the foundations of the world. All I'm saying is, is that the whole predestination thing is the fact that God already knows. That's basically it. It doesn't change the fact that he died for all the world. It doesn't change the fact that every man, woman, and child that ever had lived, ever will live, will come to a place one day where they have to make a choice and they have to make a decision to either worship him or not, to love him or not, to believe in him or not. And I can say this, it is the most important decision that you will ever make, you know, with your life. So 2 Peter 3, 9, at the end of the verse, it says this, God basically says, I don't want anybody to perish, no one. I want everybody to come to repentance. I want to be with everybody. And so he didn't want anybody to be separated from him. Imagine being in a place where there's no God. There's no hope. There's no future. There's no health. There's no anything. There, all there is is suffering. There's another word for it. It's called hell. It's called hell. The crazy thing about life now is that everybody experiences this thing called common grace from God. We all do. The most evil person on the planet receives common grace from God. You know, remember we read it already in the Sermon on the Mount. He says he, he sends rain on the unjust. He sends sun to the ungodly and to the, to the evil. You know, these are, these are common grace things. Even the most evil person on the planet is going to have some health and some things go their way and some success and have their needs met and have rain and sun and all these different things. Absolutely. All I'm saying is this, there's, there's a possibility that without Christ, you know, it's for sure that without Christ, you're cut off from all of it, from all of God's grace, from all of God's provision, from all of God's love. You're cut off from all of it. There's a verse in Revelation 21.8. It ought to be read more. And it's not a fun verse. I'm going to tell you up front, it's not a fun verse. I know this is a heavy day. It's a heavy service. But the Bible says, but the cowardly and the unbelieving and the vile and the murderous and the sexually immoral and those who practice magic arts, those who are idolaters and all liars, the Bible says their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. I mean, that's what the Bible says. And then the Bible goes on to say, this is the second death. So the Bible talks about two deaths. We look at death as just being dying on this earth. That's not, that's not really death. I mean, that's death, but it's only a picture of, real, of, a, of another death that could potentially come. When you die physically, you're separated from your family. When you die spiritually, the second death, like it says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, you're separated from God forever. And there is no more hope. It's over. And so we're doing everything we can to tell everybody before they get to that place. You know, I'm not trying to, I'm just, again, trying to be a messenger, you know, about what God says in his word. And have you ever heard people say, I wouldn't, worship, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy? Well, hello, exactly. That's what we're talking about. You know, it applies here. And, and God wants us to get to the place in our life where we wouldn't wish this on our worst enemy. When I was a kid, and I've told you the story so many times, you know, there was a group of kids down the street that I didn't like, they didn't like me, and I didn't like them, and you know, every once in a while, they'd just pick on me, make fun of me, and I'd throw it back at them, and we'd be in, getting fights, and you know, and we were in a fight one time on Scott Drive in Fairfax City. I was a city kid, <laughs> no. Um, but my mom, came down the street. I don't know if a neighbor told her or whatever. She came down the street, grabbed me by the arm, walked me all the way up the street. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I, I've told you the story, but, you know, we're walking across the front yard and I stopped and I looked at my mom and I said, I hope that none of them get saved. That's what I said. I hope none of them get saved. And my mom looked at me and she said, Barry, don't you ever say that again. Because that's a nice way of saying, I hope they all go to you know where. <laughs> and 
you know, my mom taught me a huge lesson that day. It's tempting to want the worst for your enemies, but God said to pray for them and God said to love them. And here's two reasons why. Quick, number one, prayer for an enemy could unlock their potential for God. And I mean, it could unlock potential that nobody knew they had, that they didn't know they had, that believers didn't know they had, that their family didn't know they had. I mean, the sky's the limit when you pray for people. Evil people, good people, unjust people, just people, whatever. The sky's the limit. One of the most famous examples of that is Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus did everything he could to ruin and wreck people's lives, destroy the church. And he later became the Apostle Paul. And one of the reasons why was because of a guy named Stephen. Stephen is described one of the first deacons ever in the church, ever. <laughs> I mean, Church of Jerusalem, church kind of guy. And this is how the Bible describes him. He's a man full of God's grace and full of power. And he performed many amazing miracles. Let me put it to you this way. He was so effective at what he did that the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law decided that they had no other choice but to just take him out. That's what they were literally gonna do. So they bring him in for questioning. Some of the things that he says, absolutely great on their last nerve. They can't stand some of the things that he says. He says the truth, but they, they're infuriated by it. And so in verse 57 of Acts 7, there's an account of it in the Bible. It's crazy. It says, they put their hands over their ears they began shouting. They rushed at him. Um, they uh, dragged him out of the city, began to stone him with stones. And then this is the part that gets me. His accusers take off their coats and lay them at the feet of a young man by the name of Saul. Saul of Tarsus, the same guy that's gonna become the greatest missionary that ever walked the planet. So Saul of Tarsus is watching the execution of a man who was full of grace, full of power, and did miracles everywhere. That's the kind of man that he's watching all this take place. While this happens in verse 59, the Bible says, as they stoned him, as he was being murdered, Stephen prayed. This is what he prays. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then, then it says he fell to his knees, and I love it. It says shouting, he shouted it out. Lord, don't charge them with this sin. That's what he yells and screams out. Saul of Tarsus watches the bravery and the godliness and the power of a man by the name of Stephen pray for him as Paul is involved or Saul is involved in murdering him. Can I just ask you this? Is that something you're gonna forget easily? I don't think so. I, I can only imagine Saul of Tarsus laying in bed at night dreaming and seeing Stephen over and over and over again, a man praying for him as he murders him. That had to just rock his world. I'm gonna tell you, I believe it, it changed his life. Did Saul do a terrible thing to Stephen? Absolutely he did. But you know what? Stephen prayed for him anyway. And it led to an incredible upside for, for Saul to become Paul. It led to incredible potential. Paul became the greatest missionary that ever walked wrote half the New Testament, started churches in all over the known world, and was instrumental in leading tens of thousands of people to faith in Jesus Christ. And it started with a man who was being put to death, praying for the one putting him to death. Pray for your enemies. You have no idea what the upside is as far as their potential. The second and final thing is this, pray for an en prayer for an enemy could be the very thing that leads them to Christ. You may think they will never accept Christ. Pray for them anyway. I don't want to pray for them. Pray for them anyway. You never know what God is going to do through the prayers of his people, even for people that are would be considered your enemies. How would you feel about people who nailed you to a cross? Probably not good. So Jesus is on the cross, like I said earlier, staring down at the people who put him on the cross and he prays the prayer, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I don't, and I've thought this for a lot of years, and there may be people that disagree with me, but I don't think it's a coincidence that the Bible specifically calls out a particular Roman officer or centurion who is standing at the base of the cross, 
probably the one who is ordering everything to happen, is in charge of the whole thing, and he's looking up now at, at the cross. Jesus says, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. He gives up the ghost and he dies. Yes, it becomes dark. <laughs> yes, there's an earthquake. Yes, the veil in the temple rips. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. I don't doubt that. But here's a man that hears Jesus Christ praying for him as he was murdering him, as he was putting him to death. And I believe that prayer was instrumental in Mark chapter 15 and verse number 39, when the Bible says, when the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he died, he exclaimed, this man was the son of God. I believe that man walked away justified. Why? Because he believed. He believed that Jesus was the son of God. And I honestly believe that Paul, same thing with Paul. Paul took it to heart when he saw Stephen do what he did. 100%. Why? Paul and Silas are in Philippi. They get arrested because they're believers, because they have faith in Jesus and they're preaching. That's why they get arrested. And so here they are in prison. They're whipped. They're, they're, they're chained in prison. And I think about a jailer who is standing watch over them, probably again, like the Roman centurion in charge of them, making sure that they're you know, chained, making sure that they're beaten, making sure that they pay. And here, tell me it's a coincidence that in Acts chapter 16 and verse number 25, the Bible says around midnight, Paul and Silas began to pray. Can you imagine if they begin to pray for the one who was watching over them? This big, huge soldier that's watching over them in this jail in Philippi. And as he's watching over them, Paul's going in, Lord, I pray for this, this jailer. He didn't look happy, God. He looks really sad. God, there must be something going on at home. He just, just doesn't seem fulfilled. So Lord, we pray for our jailer. God, we pray your arms around him. God, that you'd bless him. God, that you, I mean, can you imagine if he's praying out loud for the man? I don't know what happened other than the fact that after they prayed and sang, an earthquake came and all the prison doors opened and all the chains that were on their wrists fell off because it was a miracle of God. But I do know this, that same soldier came back into Paul and Silas and asked the question, what must I do to be saved? Now, he wasn't thinking spiritually. He was thinking, I'm dead because all the people I've been watching are gone. That's why Paul said, relax, we're all here. But there was influence there, why? It's conjecture on my part, yes but I believe that Paul prayed for him. And now he's asking him what must, the thing that blows me away is Acts 16, 32 through 34. A couple of verses. They share the word of the Lord with him and all who believe in his household. 33, even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Can you imagine Paul and Silas getting washed, having their wounds washed by the same jailer that ordered the beating, by the same jailer that ordered them to be put in chains and in the dungeon. And now they're looking at each other, Paul and Silas are going. Literally, same jailers washing their backs had just accepted Christ as savior. The Bible says everyone, including the jailer, were, were baptized. He brought them into the house, set a meal before them. He and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Who, what person in their right mind would have predicted any of that hap would have happened? It all goes back to a prayer. It all goes back to worship. It all goes back to a man who learned a lesson from another guy by the name of Stephen that had an influence in his life that now has an influence in a jailer's life that has an influence in an entire family's life that probably was the the epicenter or the, the start of the church there in Philippi, you know, and, and everything that was going on, I'm telling you right now, there is huge upside to praying for your enemies. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's something you're gonna wanna do, you know, but there's absolute huge upside to it because they were able to see miracles take place. Let me just say this. I'm closing with this. A lot of times we're just confused as to who the enemy is. I say, 
pray for your enemies, but technically they're not really even your enemies. Your enemies may think they're your enemies. You may think they're your enemies, but actually they're technically your allies. Did you know that every single one of us are the same? We all have a heartbeat. We all have desires to be loved. We're all made by God. We all have a plan and a purpose. God has given us a purpose for this life. We're all going to die. We're all going to stand before God. We are all the same. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. I don't understand. I don't get it with the whole skin color thing. Why, why, why do people differentiate between? It's, it's insane. We're people made by God, loved by God. We'll stand before God. We are on the same team. We are allies. The enemy is the devil. The enemy is Satan. He's the one that wants to ruin and wreck and destroy our lives. And so, you know, I think it's just important for us to, to realize, you know, to, to realize that and to understand, you know what? I'm not going to call you my enemy anymore. I'm going to call you, I guess, my friend. And I'm going to pray for you. And just watch the miracles that God will do with a person who will be different enough to make a difference, who will love the unlovable and see God do miracles. That's the way we can see change take place in this community. That's the way we can see change take place in this world. I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute. If, if you have never made the decision to believe in and accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, to accept the invitation to RSVP to God, hey, God, got your invitation, you know, put me down for one, I'm there. You know, heard you have a place for me, I'm coming. You know, I want to be there. Why wouldn't you want that? It's the greatest invitation of all time. The, the, it's impossible for you to get there. So that's why Jesus came to die on the cross. He, when he died on the cross, he was shedding his blood so that he could forgive you of the only thing that blocks you from accepting the invitation. That's sin. Every single solitary person on the planet has sin in their lives. We all do. We're all born with it. You didn't even choose sin. You were automatically born that way. But I'll tell you what, you have a savior who, you know, isn't going to make you perfect, but it's going to forgive you and set you free from the penalty of sin. And in his eyes, you'll be perfect because you'll be holy and righteous. You'll have Jesus's righteousness added to your account. You know, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make in the history of your life, in your very, very short life. You know, if you haven't made that choice and you would like to, I'm going to give you a chance to do it right now. I want you just to, in prayer, tell God that you receive his invitation. Why don't you do that right now? Why don't you pray this? Dear Heavenly Father, I receive your invitation. I believe you love me. I believe you want me with you. I accept. I'm knocking on the door, opening the door, walking through the door. I know you're the door. I choose Jesus. I choose to believe in you. I choose to call on your name. And I pray that you would wash me clean of my sins and forgive me. I pray that you'll be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you, you know, have trouble praying for your enemies. Can I just say a quick prayer for you? I'm going to pray again. It's a double prayer. All right. Let's just pray. Lord, I pray for me and I pray for all of us at this church. I pray, God, that we will be willing to pray for people that we consider our enemies. And I pray, God, that we would see the power of you and the potential of their lives and the salvation of, of people because everyone will die and everyone will stand before you. And so God, help us to have a big picture mentality when it comes to people. Help us to look at them as allies, not enemies, and help us to pray for them, God. Help us to pray for them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Guys, thank you so much for lasting this long. And I want to just, if you accepted Christ as your savior, wow, we wanna know about it, text, um, Park Valley to 97,000 on your phone. It's totally simple. Just do that and it will notify us that you accepted Christ. We can dialogue with you. And if you, you know, have a prayer request, then just text the word prayer, words prayer praise to 97,000. And I'm telling you right now, we will pray for the prayer request that you, that you turn in. Thank you so much again for being a part of this service. We love you very much.